plant analogy every week. And yes, my plants are still doing fine, hammers. Um, uh, but we talked about a plant needs what? It needs food, it needs soil, it needs you know, sunlight, water, all those things. It needs all the right ingredients to grow. And the way I like to think of these is, uh, spirit, think of spiritual disciplines, to use my analogy further, is like a greenhouse. Okay? A, a greenhouse, it doesn't guarantee automatic growth, but it's the right environment for something to grow. And if you put the plant in the greenhouse, it has a better chance that it's going to grow, right? More likely than not. Now, there could be something wrong with the plant, but that's, right? So it's not that, well, if I just read my Bible every day and I pray six prayers and I sing two songs, then I, I have to grow, right? Well, it's not necessarily the case. You could do it for wrong reasons, right? But by doing the spiritual disciplines, you're creating an environment. You're putting yourself in the intersection of where God's Spirit works and uh, where we can grow. So don't think of it like legalistic, but think of it as, no, I'm putting myself in a good spiritual uh, greenhouse. So Bible reading, prayer, fasting, these help us to do uh, just that. And tonight we have um, a, a new one that we're going to talk about this evening. Um, whenever I do uh, pre-marriage counseling, I always tell couples, and I've said this from the pulpit, so this is not new. I usually say that when it comes to conflict in marriage, there's usually three big issues that, that, that we learn about. Uh, money, sex, and communication. And I always tell people one and two go back to three. Now, if any of you are married, you know what I'm talking about, right? The, 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 the communication is the foundation by which everything sort of lives or, or dies. And so when I talk to couples about um, money, like how do you communicate with, about money in marriage, I will remind them that um, money is not about math. Now you say, wait a minute, I didn't learn about dollars and cents and nickels and pennies in history class. I didn't learn in science class. I learned in arithmetic class. Well, it involves math, but money really, it, it speaks to our hopes and dreams and our goals. Right? What is money? Money is a tangible expression of your priorities. Right? Think about it. It, it, that's, what it that's what it actually shows. Um, I don't know if you've ever met anybody who, was a, who collected things, right? Stamp collection, whatever. My grandmother, we were just talking about before the service, my grandmother collected uh, like porcelain? Porcelain dolls. Yeah, whatever she could. And she had tons of them. A few were creepy, but she had, <laughs> she had all these dolls, right? You could walk into her house... And you knew what her hobby was like that, right? And you could tell this was something she cared about, something she loved, right? For some people, like I said, it's electronics. For some people, it's a certain team. It may be a cause, right? Every one of us, there are things you care about, and you put time into it, but you probably also put some money into it. It's something that you enjoy. Maybe other people don't enjoy but what is it? It's the, the money that goes out is a tangible expression of what you think is a, a priority. And it's kind, so it's kind of like then what Jesus said in our passage. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Right? You can look at a person's treasure and you can tell what matters to them where their desires are, but also what they think is important in their life. Um, and so our, our money uh, is a way, uh, it's, it's a window into what is our truest devotion. So we all know that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. So what do we want to do in the spiritual distance? We want to love God, right? We don't want to love money. We don't want to pursue evil. So how do we love God with our money? And that big category is what we call stewardship, okay? So that's the discipline tonight, the discipline of stewardship. Some people talk about stewardship in terms, you can speak in terms of your tongue or your time, okay? That's, that's also stewardship, but we're just going to focus on the tangible expression of treasure, as Jesus uh, calls it here. And here's what I want to do for our time that we have. 
Um, rather than just kind of go through the basics, which I will go through some of the basics you've heard before, maybe some of you haven't, here's how I want to do it, okay? Because I know everybody in this room is in different levels on this. Some of you giving materially, financially has been a part of your life from the time that you were this big, you know? Uh, when I was little and we received an allowance, I received three dollars. And I got one dollar in change so that I could figure out what 10% was, right? And of course I had to do math. I didn't care for that. But I was able to know, here's what I give to church, right? So from the earliest times that there was any money in my hands, right, that was like regularly put. Maybe some of you, that's how you grew up. You were taught that. Others of you say, this is the first time I ever heard this in my entire life. Okay, so no matter where you are, what I want to do is just ask some diagnostic questions. And you just evaluate where your heart is. And the way you're going to evaluate where your heart is, is by looking where your treasure is. Okay, so just look at your money, think about your bank account, think about your credit cards, think about your, that, and you'll see where your heart is in this. Okay, so a uh, few diagnostic questions. First question is a pretty obvious one. I, I think we can all get the answer to this question. Is who owns my money? Is it me or God? Right, that's the first, if you're going to talk anything about money, possessions, belongings, we've got to settle that issue, right? Who does it belong to? Uh, Psalm 24, verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Okay, so what does that mean? It means God not only owns the cattle on a thousand hills, he owns the hills that the cattle are on, right? If you remember uh, when Israel came back from the exile, they were supposed to build the temple and they said, uh, well, God, we're a little short on, on, you know, cash right now because, you know, we've been in exile and everything's destroyed and they came back and they, they weren't able to build it as regal and as nice as it was. And the prophet Haggai came and said, wait a minute, you, you just put a new addition on your house <laughs> and you can't build the temple. Is that what you're telling me? And the people were complaining that, hey, we're lacking in funds. And Haggai 2.8, God says, quote, the silver is mine and the gold is mine declares the Lord. God says, I have plenty of bank. I can give it to you. You don't need to worry about that because it all ultimately belongs to me. So any talk about money, any talk about finances, it has to begin with that starting point. What you own, you don't own. What we have doesn't belong to us. You know, you've all heard the cliche, you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul, right? right? You're not going to take it with you, right? And so what, what are we supposed to do with it now? Well, I think this is why we think about this idea of stewardship, right? Um, now, to some people, that idea is offensive, that God owns everything, right? He owns what I have. Um, and some people say, well, you know, I earned what I have by the sweat of my brow. I earned what I have by my, you know, by my efforts. And that is true in that we work and we put in the effort and we're supposed to work. It's part of God's good creation. Um, but I, I get kind of nervous uh, or, or a, a little concerned when I hear someone say, well, you know, I built that car, that house with my own two hands. Well, who gave you your hands? Right? Who, who gave you the lumber? Where did the lumber come from? Right? From the trees. Who made the trees? So, yes, Deuteronomy 8. Israel came in the promise of what God says. He says, I not only give you wealth. I give you the power to make wealth. So, yes, you might be the one that plows, and you might be the one, where did the dirt come from? <laughs> right? Where did the animals come from? It all comes from God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. There is nothing you have, nothing under your right responsibility, that didn't come from God. <clears throat> and it all came from him, and it should be used to go back to him. So this is what we mean by, by stewardship. So what is stewardship then? I'll give you a really simple answer, okay? It, here's, here's the mindset you have to have. I get to manage God's money. That's it. I get to manage God's money. So you have to start by asking the question, how would God spend his money? Because it, it actually is his money, right? And I want to honor him, right? I want to live for him. So, so how if, if God was here, right, when payday comes, this is God's money. God, what do you, what do you want me uh, to do with it? Um, so stewardship. When I was in college, there was a family in the church. Um, I still can't believe they did this looking back, but whatever. Um, 
that they were gone for like a whole summer and they asked me and my brother to live there. Like, it's like to watch the house feed the dogs, that kind of thing, right? Like I was 19, he was like 20 something. I don't know why they left the house to these two college students, right? <laughs> but, and I guess we had a good, rep, some good reputation, right? We stayed there, but I remember like sleeping at their house and like, you know, getting the paper and the mail, doing all those things. But I remember, you know, eating out of their fridge. I said, you can have whatever's here. And whatever. And, but I remember literally eating cereal and being very careful, don't drop the bowl, <laughs> right? I'd put it in the sink really carefully because it, right? And I, I, I don't put my feet on the couch, right? What? Because this is not mine, right? Like I'm, I'm, I'm caring for it, but it's not ultimately mine. I'm a steward of this, and they're gonna, I'm gonna, I'm accountable when like they're coming back from Europe, right? So I'm gonna have to show them what I did with it, and if I took care of it or not. And the same is true with our money. God gave it to us, like He's given you a little slice of His money, and every one of us are gonna stand before Him one day and give an account. What He's gonna say? What did you do with it? In fact, how many parables did Jesus tell? <laughs> Tons of parables, and by the way, they don't all end well for the people who don't do their job. So that's the first question you have to ask when you talk about stewardship. Who owns my money? Is it me or is it God? And the clear answer of scripture is of course, it's God. So that's the first question. The second question is, do I really trust God to provide? So when it comes to your money, what does your money say? What does your bank account say? Does it say I truly do, that I really trust God to provide? Um, we won't read this one. I have several passages here, but uh, can somebody tell me real quick what was the story of the um, the widow's sometimes called the widow's mite? What happened in the story? Correct. Yeah, gave her last two coins, and Jesus said, "I trade you this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury, for they all put in order out of their surplus, but she gave out of her poverty." And she put in all that she owned, everything she had to live on. Okay? So what does that say? She trusted God to provide for her. Jesus said, it's literally the last penny she had. And in faith, she gave this. And Jesus said, I tell you, even though it was only two pennies, it was more than all those guys bringing $10,000 checks because that didn't hurt them. They didn't have to rely on God the next day. They just got some more money out. But, but she instead, by doing this in faith, he says it. So giving, it really is the litmus test of faith. It really is the litmus test. Because we can talk about, oh, I believe, I believe, I believe, right? Remember a couple weeks ago, I gave you some theological math. Remember we said uh, uh, your stated belief times your actual practice equals your actual belief. So my stated belief, I trust, believe God will provide. Actual practice, mine. Then your actual belief is you don't really believe that God will provide. So, it, so giving is the litmus test that shows whether or not uh, we trust God. Um, th think of it this way. Here, here's another way to think about it. Uh, who in here owns a passport? Like who has a passport? Oh, wow. You all need to go on a mission trip. <laughs> You're all guilty. Well, okay. Yeah, all right. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not like uber patriotic, I, I, you know, but like the, 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 the time when I feel like most patriotic in life is when I'm traveling overseas and I present my passport. I don't know why. It's like, I'm an American. Like, oh, whatever. Come at me. You know, I don't know. Like there's something about it. It just, it's like, it, it's like, this is my, right. Right. So you say your passport and it's, this is who I am. Right. It makes it clear. Right. Think about it this way. Giving, according to Jesus, giving is, is like showing your passport that you're a citizen of the kingdom. Like it's literally your credentials to say, I, I'm not living for this world. In fact, so little that I can just give my, I can just give it away. I'm not bound by it. That's not where I find my hope, my purpose, my meaning. I'm actually living for another kingdom. And here's the proof of it, right? Here's my, here's my passport to my citizenship uh, in heaven. Uh, I often hear some people say, well, the main reason they, that they don't give is the fear of the future. Well, we don't know what's coming down the pike. And yes, Proverbs tells us we should be like the wise ant. I'm not saying we should throw all caution to the wind. 
But sometimes when we, when we hedge our bets by saying, well, I've got to make sure that I, 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 I'm, I'm prepared for the future, and it, it leads us to hoarding or keeping, what it does is this. It shows that we're trying to find our security in money and not God, right? This, this, I, this is, my own heart get, gets tempted by this, right? Like a lot of families, right? You're, you're told, good old Dave Ramsey, right? You've got to have this emergency fund, and then you get it right just in case something disastrous and I got six kids and it's like, okay, then anybody can go to the hospital at any point, right? So we're, and I find myself in my own heart like, all right, we know what that is. But if expenses go out and things have to be dealt with, her, my, my brain, my heart starts going, oh, where, where's the money going? You know, you're going to have enough if this happens or that happens. And it, it, my heart has to stop and go, wait a minute, that's not my security. That's not the thing that I find my, 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 my contentment in. It has to be in Christ. And so it, it really is the question, do I really trust God to provide? Or do I have to be the one that provides? The widow gave her two pennies because she's saying, God will take care of me. And so I think uh, we ask that question. Who owns my money, me or God? Do I really trust God to provide? Number three, is my giving sacrificial and generous? Is my giving sacrificial and generous. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 for this one. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verses 1 through 5. So uh, Paul is talking here about uh, the Christians here and notice what he, how he describes them, all right? In verse 2, that in a great ordeal of affliction, right? So in other words, they had their own money problems, right? They were already in a economic crunch in a great ordeal of affliction, their, uh, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave them. Like, it didn't mathematically make sense what they gave. It seemed extreme. How can these people afford to give, Paul said. And through that, he says, I I'm telling you, it shows the fact that they understood that their giving was sacrificial which is really interesting here. This goes to show us that uh, giving is not just for rich Christians. It's for all Christians. They, they, they were literally, like, I promise you, by our standard of living, these people were on food stamps. I promise you. And Paul says, I am flabbergasted at how sacrificially they gave. Because why? They first gave themselves to the Lord. And how do you know you give yourself to the Lord? It shows up, right? It shows up in, in your priorities in how uh, you give. Uh, I tell my children often, listen, if you're generous, if you're not generous with $10, what makes you think you'll be generous with $10 million? Right? Because everybody says, oh, when I get more money, I'll, I'll, I'll give to this or that. Well, if you don't do it with few things, why do you think you would do it with, with much? Why? Because it's not a calculator issue. It's not a math issue. It's a heart issue, and it's a, it's a challenge. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Giving isn't sacrificial unless it hurts. So when I say giving should be sacrificial, notice Paul, Paul, he says they were already under a great deal of affliction, but they still gave beyond their ability, even begging to, to participate in what was taking place. So how do you know your giving is sacrificial? I'll, I'll give you a couple of ideas here. Does your giving, and, and by giving I mean to the church, or to others in need, Scripture tells us to give to those that are poor, right? Something Paul says we were eager to do. Does your giving cause you to make different choices about how you live? Because if you don't have to make any other different choices, it's not a sacrifice. Right? But, but if, right, you say, well, I'm, we may have to defer that purchase. I might have to cancel that subscription. And you go, oh, that hurts. <gasps> Bingo. That's a sacrifice. A sacrifice, right? It, was none, it wasn't pleasant to be sacrificed. It was something that was painful. And Paul says that they gave in such a way that it was uh, of, of that quality of sacrifice. So does that show up in your life? When you, when you look at your bank account, when you look at those things, is it, is it inconvenience you at all? Or is it just, well, I've got this, like I'm only going to give of a surplus. Paul says, no, no, they, they gave deeply in a way that was sacrificial. Proverbs 3 tells us to honor the Lord with your first fruits, right? Literally the best of the crop 
was given to God. Not the worst, if you know the Old Testament laws, not the blemished and, you know, the sickly. No, they, they brought the very best. Why? Because they were saying tangibly, God is first. The kingdom is first. What, what, what God will take care of me, I trust him. It was that tangible spread. All right, next. Does, this is a little redundant, but you know what? Repetition is the mother of retention. Does my bank account show that I follow Jesus? That, that's the question. Does, does my bank account show that I follow Jesus? All right, L Luke 16, 13. You can just listen to this if you don't want to turn there. Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. For either will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And, and what two masters does he mean? He tells us the end. You cannot serve God and what? Wealth, right? Money. Mammon, I think the King James says, right? So here's my question with this one. Think of it this way. Imagine if you drop dead tomorrow. What's the, what's okay? Luke 6, uh, 16, 13. 16, 13. Yep. Imagine you drop dead tomorrow, okay? You, you, you died right suddenly. And for some reason, uh, a, a historian, a biographer wanted to write on your life. And they got access to all of your financial statements, all of your records. Could they, looking at that, see that you were a Christian? Could, could they, looking at that, see, wow, they really cared about the church. They really cared about the poor. They really cared about missions. Right? It's obvious, right? Because you're, which, which master are you serving? Right? And so the, 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 there's a sense in which um, it's, it's, it's important to make clear that we're following Jesus. Um, the most common objection I hear people sometimes say is, well, pastor, I, I just, you know, I can't afford to give. But if we take everything Jesus says, right, let's be honest. Honestly, you can't afford not to give. And here's why. Because you're taking a pretty big gamble to say, I trust Jesus, but on judgment day, I will have no tangible expression that I trusted Jesus. Scripture says every man will be judged according to his deeds. And there is no clearer record of your deeds than your financial statements. Right? It's literally showing the priorities of your life. And so if it doesn't show that, then if you say, well, yeah, but I trust Jesus, but, right? Jesus says, are you really serving God or are you serving well? Think of the contrast of two men in the Gospels. Remember the two men in the Gospels? We have Zacchaeus, and you remember the rich young ruler. They both encountered the same Jesus. They both had money, and they both had two radically different responses. Right? What did Zacchaeus do? He encounters Jesus, and after meeting Jesus, what does he do? He pays everybody back he's defrauded, and then gave away half away of stuff, right, to, to the poor. And what did Jesus say? <laughs> Salvation has come to this man's house today. Now, he didn't buy salvation. That's not what I mean. He's saying, this is clear evidence this man is repentant. He's lived in greed and he's clearly no longer living in greed and in sin, right? That's what repentance is. I'm turning from sin. I'm turning to Jesus. So he showed, it showed up tangibly in his life, right? Rich young ruler, what happens? He has lots of stuff. Jesus says, well, follow me and give away your stuff, right? Show that you trust me. And what does he do? Because of his great riches, what? He went away sad. Now, what's the difference in those two men? One man made his money his God, and the other man made his money his servant. So that's the question. Is, is money your God? <coughs> got to have it, got to worship it, got to keep it. That's my security, my identity. It's all in this. Or is it actually, no, God is it, and money is just a tool by which I'm able to serve uh, others. Next question, is my giving planned and regular? Is it planned and regular? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 for this one. So this is one of the clearest New Testament um, uh, instructions about giving, particularly in the local church, right? Paul's writing to the Corinthians, and he says, here's what I want you to do. When you, when you get paid, because in those days they didn't get paid every two weeks or every month, they get literally paid like every day, right? Like at the end of the day. And so he says, when you get paid, uh, during the week, you set something aside so that on Sunday, you're not rummaging through your pockets going, boy, do I have anything to give? He specifically says, no, you set it aside on purpose, and then you come ready to give it. 
right? So the, we're receiving it, but we're not having to collect it out of you, right? You're not having to find it. You've set it aside to bring it. But look what he says there in verse 2. On the first day of the week, which, by the way, what day is that? Sunday. It's the Lord's Day, so he's talking about going to church. Who's supposed to do it? The rich people among you? Each one of you. Is that the 60-year-olds and the 20-year-olds? Is that the people with 14 kids and the people with no kids? Is that for those with part-time jobs and those with full-time jobs? Right? Those on food stamps, those with a portfolio? Each one of you. Right? Even if it's the widow's might, it's just two pennies. Right? Everybody, he said, each one of you is to, t is to put aside and save as he may prosper. In other words, he's not expecting everybody to give the same. It's in accordance to what you can give, he says. You give, and he says, so that no collection is made uh, when I come. Uh, by the way, that statement there, in keeping with his income, um, we don't have time to go into this in detail, which I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards. My encouragement, my advice with people is saying, Pastor, where do I start? I think the Old Testament gives us a great starting point, the idea of a tithe or a 10%, right? I think 10% is a, is a great place to start. I think it's a terrible place to stop. I think it's the floor, not the ceiling in the Christian life. Because why? Because we're supposed to follow the example of Jesus, right? Now, things get complicated because there were multiple tithes in the Old Testament, so it was actually like 23%. So if you want to go be an overachiever, by all means, do that. But remember, Israel was a theocracy, so they were actually paying for their judges. All right, this is complicated. Okay, I told you. I wasn't going to talk about it, and then I started talking about it. But, but that simple idea of a, of a 10%, right, which was a regular pattern they gave, it's a wonderful place to begin. And Paul says, as each one prospers, for some people, be honest, 10% wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't change the way you live. It wouldn't be a sacrifice. 10% would just be, yeah, oh yeah, I can, I can skim that off, right? Then it's not sacrificial. It's not actually that, that, that kind of level of generosity, right? But for others, 8% might be sacrificial. And I think in that, God is well pleased, right? Because we don't give under compulsion. We give what? As cheerful givers, Paul says. So is my plan is my giving planned and regular? First day of the week, right? This is why we have an offering. Which, by the way, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to regret saying this because I shouldn't say things that I haven't written down. Think about. But the elders and I, I, I we've talked about something, and I'm, I, please don't think I'm trying to solve this right now. But I, I, you know, when COVID happened, right, we had to switch, right? We switched to using the offering boxes. And I have several times told the elders, I said, are we under discipling a generation by not actively giving as part of our worship? Now, we had to do it out of necessity, right? And I'm not saying what we're doing is wrong because the Bible doesn't say how we collect it, okay? So I'm not going to be a legalist on that. It doesn't say how we collect it. It says we should collect it. But I've asked the question, are we under discipling a whole generation? Because my kids don't even some remember passing plates in church, right? Is that a bad thing or is that a I'm not trying to solve this right now, but I am saying that money matters. And, and money as a collection, as part of worship, it actually matters. So much so that Paul says, make sure there is, every person does something and gives. So you can only do that if you plan it. You can only do that if it's regular. And that's how our should giving should be. All right, a couple more real quick. Um, next question, when I see real needs, do I reach for my wallet? When I see real needs, do I reach for my wallet? I, we won't turn there, but I'm sure most of you are familiar with the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 4. What happens? The people in Acts 2, it says what? They sold their possessions, right? And they gave, right, to each other in the church, right, as what? As anyone might have need. So they looked across the room and they saw a brother, a sister, right, a single mom who was struggling. And they said, hey, we've got some money. Hey, I sold some land. I can give to help you, Right. And so they intentionally made a point when they saw a need, they do it. Acts chapter 4, it happens again. A need came up, and they were ready generously to give uh, and to help others. Uh, if you know, 1 Timothy 5 says that a man who does not care for his own household, provide for his own household, uh, Paul says he's worse than an unbeliever, right? So, uh, and he's talking about widows, actually, in that text. A man who doesn't care for his family member that's a widow if he, if he kicks his mom to the, you know, his widowed mom to the curb, he said that man's worse than an unbeliever, right? An infidel, the King James says, right? But my point in that is what? Is, is the, the church 
is the spiritual family of God. And so, if yes, we provide for our physical families. That's part, that's part of our good stewardship. But we also are to provide for the family that Jesus has given us in, in our brothers and sisters and those uh, around us. Um, and by the way, can I just say, I know this is, you know, there's a lot we're dealing with here. Th- this is one that I think overall general, and Bradley, you can back me up on this. I think our church excels at in terms of when real needs come up. I cannot in my 20 years here remember a time that I, we didn't stand up and say, hey, this family has a need, this is something, or even just privately talked about it that people didn't give. Last year, this church, people gave over $45,000 that was not in our budget, it was not a special offering, just gave to help various families in need in our church and outside of our church, okay? But here's the thing, I'm pretty sure there wasn't 100% participation. So if you're a part of that, praise God. If you weren't, why not? When you see your real need, how does it show up? You reach for your wallet. That's what the early church did. This person needs something, I'm, I'm going to be part of the solution. I'm going to help them through this time. You say, well, I only have $5. It doesn't say how much you have to do it. But you give what you can to help the person uh, in need. Lastly and finally, I think the last question we ask about stewardship is, do I want God uh, to bless me? Do I want God to bless me? You can turn there if you want. You don't have to. Luke chapter 6. We all are familiar um, with the prosperity gospel, which says that God wants uh, that God wants every Christian to be healthy and wealthy and prosperous. Um, obviously, that is a lie, um, and um, it's very popular, but it's very false at the same time. But what makes that teaching particularly bad, I think, is the fact that like all false teaching, it is truth distorted. Right? All false teaching is truth distorted. Okay? So there's a kernel of truth in that, that God does want to bless his people, right? But to say that that extends automatically to health and wealth is to misread the Bible. Uh, in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus says, Give and it will be given to you. They will pour it into your lap, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. Paul likewise in 1 Corinthians won't turn there talks about how God loves a cheerful giver and what? Right? He gives bread to the eater, he gives seed to the sower. God provides for those uh, in what uh, they need. And so it is true that God provides for his people as we give, as we show that we're trusting him. I often say he has promised to provide for your needs but not your greeds. Right? So it doesn't mean he's going to give you every penny of everything you ever want. But I can promise you this. He will provide for your needs and he will bless you. And there are blessings that are way more important than money. And if you haven't experienced it, right? Malachi 3, what does it say? Test me. Try me in this, God says. Right? Bring your money, give it, and see if I won't take care of you. So my, my challenge... Oh, the last one on that. What did you say? It is more blessed to what? To give than to receive. We've all been on the receiving end, and we know how wonderful that is. Jesus said, if you want to be blessed, it is actually more blessed, right, to give. So my challenge to all of you in this room is a couple things. Number one, if you're a person who doesn't give, my challenge to you is to repent, right? Just as prayerlessness is a sin, so too stinginess or being stingy is a sin. Right? We are called to do this. Um, if you are giving and you've given regularly, sacrificially, look at the level of your giving. Has it changed as your income has changed? Has it changed over your time? Or is it just, oh, now with cost of living adjustments, this doesn't hurt as bad as it used to? Because our giving is supposed to be a sacrifice uh, that we give to help others. So what is our goal in this spiritual disciplines? Let's, ultimately, what is our goal? It's to look like Jesus, to live like Jesus, and to love like Jesus. Well, at the end of the day, you are never more like Jesus than when you give. Because our Savior is what? He's a giving Savior. For God so loved the world that He gave, right? God gives, and He gives, and He gives. And we should be people known as those that are generous and give and give as we can.